Typical in our diet, we have about 50 grams of lipids per day, so they're a large part of our diet. Um, and lipids behave very differently from proteins and carbs. We should know this as we remember, remind ourselves of the makeup of lipids, the fact that they're non-polar, they do not behave or um, interact nicely in aqueous environments. And so lipid absorption is gonna be different from what we saw with proteins and carbs. Um, so for lipids to be absorbed, when they first come into the intestine, they're acted upon by lipase. So lipase is coming from the pancreas in the pancreatic secretions. And lipases can only break down the fat at the edge of these large fat droplets. So let's say you had some butter or some oil or some avocado in your diet and you move those fats into the intestines. They're really sitting in the intestine in these huge fat droplets, right? Because they're not interacting with the other aqueous solutions in your intestine. And so the lipases are only going to be able to pinch off the fat that's at the edge of these large droplets. This is where bile comes in. This is where bile salts come in. Bile salts are going to act as a detergent to kind of break up or emulsify those large fat droplets into smaller fat droplets, a process called emulsification. And here, the lipase can access the entirety of the fat droplet once it's in a much smaller um, a much smaller size. So bile, bile salts are important to emulsifying fats so that they can be uh, digested and then absorbed appropriately. So this is what a bile salt looks like. It's synthesized in the liver. It's made from cholesterol. Um, bile salts are amphipathic molecules. They have uh, a part of the molecule that interacts with water and then a part of the molecule that interacts with fats. So because they, because they have this amphipathic or dual um, polarity, there's, there's a nonpolar portion and a polar portion, they're the perfect enzyme to do this job. They can act as um, an emulsifier getting into the middle of the fats, but also exist in the aqueous environment that is in our small intestines. So they get into these large fat droplets. So here's a large fat globule and these bile salts have this dual polarity where they can get into the middle of this fat droplet and really break this fat droplet into smaller portions. Now, once it's broken down, the pancreatic lipases can get to it and it's gonna break down triglycerides into monoglycerides and fatty acids. And then the fatty acids and monoglycerides can be absorbed. There's also micelles that can be created. We talked about micelles. There are also these amphipathic molecules um, that help to distribute fats a little bit more evenly and um, move them around the body in a better way, okay? Let's talk about how they're actually absorbed across the uh, epithelial membrane. So only fatty acids and monoglycerides can be diffused across the epithelium, right? So we have to get triglycerides broken down to either of these two components, either monoglycerides or fatty acids. Now, because we know that our phospholipid bilayer is made of fats, these fats can diffuse right through the apical surface of these cells. And when they enter the cell, they're gonna to go to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum of these cells, which, which is one of the organelles inside the cell. They're gonna repackage themselves into triglycerides. From the smooth ER, they're gonna make their way to the Golgi apparatus, which is another organelle inside the cell. The Golgi apparatus is like the post office of the cell. Here, they're gonna be repackaged into another type of molecule called a chylomicron. And then from there, the chylomicrons are going to be secreted by exocytosis into the interstitial fluid and then make their way via the lacteal into the lymphatic system. Okay, so kind of a more extensive process, but that's only because fats are so unique in their nature that they're going to require a little bit of uh, some more uh, steps to the process in order for them to be absorbed. So let's review this here once again. We go from this large fat droplet. The bile salts are going to break this down into smaller fat droplets, and then lipases are going to break this down into triglycerides. And then from triglycerides, um, we're going to break these down into monoglycerides or fatty acids. 
My cells are only required to help fats reach their equilibrium so that fats can be distributed more evenly throughout the body and not kind of absorbed in one area. But in order for them to be absorbed across the apical surface, they must be in the form of monoglycerides or those free fatty acids. Once they get inside the cell, they're gonna to go to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. They're gonna be repackaged into triglycerides once again. From the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, they make their way to the Golgi apparatus where they're packaged into chylomicrons. Now chylomicrons can exist better in the aqueous environment. Um, and so they're packaged into these chylomicrons, they're exocytosed out of the cell, they cross the interstitial fluid and they're absorbed into the lacteal, which is a connection to the lymphatic circulation, okay? From the lymphatic circulation, they're pretty much gonna make their way through to the vascular circulation and go to the liver where they can be repackaged and processed um, appropriately. Let's look at what happens to the bile after this happens. So after bile is no longer needed, remember bile is only doing a very small task in one part of the intestine. So only in the duodenum, bile is released from the gallbladder. It's gonna emulsify those large fat droplets. And then when it gets to the distal part of the intestine in the ileum, they're actually gonna be reuptaken or reabsorbed back into the vasculature, back into these capillaries make their way via the portal circulation back to the liver where they can be recirculated or uh, recycled to make some more bile, to make new bile salts once again. So this is a really important way that we can recycle or recirculate bile um, as opposed to making new bile every time. Okay, let's go through here the absorption of some of the vitamins and minerals. So first off, our fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K, these are absorbed with lipids. So they're gonna be absorbed within the lipid droplets or in the form of micelles and chylomicrons in a very similar way to the absorption of fats. Um, Water-soluble vitamins, on the other hand, are gonna require special transport proteins. And then B12 vitamins specifically, we talked about this earlier, is gonna require intrinsic factor, which is secreted from cells of the stomach. So different vitamins have different mechanisms of being absorbed. Um, and this is the reason why things like fat-soluble vitamins, the body can hold on to these longer because we can store fat, whereas water-soluble vitamins are kind of lost a little bit more aggressively um, with, um, with different, with, with, um, with feces, with um, urine. They're going to be lost a little bit more aggressively than our fat-soluble vitamins because fats can be stored, fat-soluble vitamins can be stored in our fats um, whereas water-soluble vitamins cannot. As far as some of the minerals, sodium is absorbed via a solvent drag. So we talked about this idea that solutes move and then water moves. So this is the way that sodium is reabsorbed as a part of that, um, that osmosis, that osmolarity gradient that moves water. Um, sodium is actively absorbed in the jejunum, the ileum, and then the, the colon as well. Chloride is going to passively follow sodium reabsorption. So wherever sodium goes, chloride kind of takes a ride along. And that is how, so, um, that is how chloride is reabsorbed. And that is going to create solute movement, which moves water as well. So that same mechanism that we talked about in terms of the movement of solutes and water across the proximal tubule in the kidneys. Potassium is also passively absorbed, and then it can be secreted when the luminal concentrations are low. So if there's not adequate concentrations of potassium in the luminal content, potassium will actually be secreted because of the disruption of that gradient. But typically, it's passively absorbed according to a high-low gradient from the lumen inside the cell. Let's talk about bicarbonate. So bicarbonate we know is uh, absorbed in the jejunum, right? So it's secreted into the duodenum. It is absorbed into the jejunum. And then in the ileum and colon, it's secreted in exchange for chloride ions. So if you remember that mechanism of exchanging chloride for bicarb, um, 
on the basolateral surface of our, our uh, tubule cells in the kidneys. That very same mechanism is the way that we absorb uh, bicarb and the way that we excrete bicarb in the colon as well. It's gonna be exchanged for chloride ions. All right, and then calcium is actively absorbed in the duodenum and jejunum. It's gonna to bind to some of these proteins in the brush border called calcium binding proteins. That's gonna transport it inside the epithelial cell. And then it's gonna cross the basolateral surface of these cells by the calcium pump, which actively pumps it from the cell into the underlying capillary. So this is how we absorb calcium. And most of that absorption happens in the duodenum and the jejunum. Iron, you would have talked about iron um, a little bit before in the cardiovascular system. Iron must be bound to transferrin in order to be moved around. The body is secreted by enterocytes. Enterocytes are the cells that are lining the small intestine. Um, they secrete this transferrin. It binds the iron in our diet. It forms this transferrin iron complex, which allows it to be moved around the body uptaken by a receptor-mediated endocytosis, which simply means that um, uh, certain receptors on the cell are going to bind to these uh, transferrin ion complexes, and then the entire complex will be engulfed or endocytosed into the cell. Some of the iron will be stored as ferritin, so if it's not being mobilized, it's going to be in its storage form, which is called ferritin, and then if it needs to be more mobilized, it's going to be bound to transferrin. Water movement is pretty simple in the GI. It's going to be moving by osmosis, um, so it's, that's a passive process. So again, this idea that solute movement is followed by water movement is the basis for water reabsorption. So as solutes such as sodium and chloride move across the gastrointestinal wall, so will uh, water follow as that gradient of um, os that osmolarity gradient is being created. So we typically secrete about seven liters of water per day and we intake about two liters of water per day. And so water is being secreted in order to lubricate the GI tract in the form of mucus, in the form of these digestive juices. And then we're also intaking water that's being absorbed from our diet, from things that we're bringing in. Right, remember that food has some, some, uh, some degree of water to it as well. 